Thanks, MC, and uh, thank you everyone for, for coming today. Great to see you all uh, in person. Uh, so today uh, I'm going to talk through three things. First thing is the outlook for value style versus the growth style. Uh, in my view, that's one of the most important things to get right. Say that you bet on growth and growth underperforms significantly. You've got to have extremely good stock selection just to breach breach that gap. So anticipating what style is going to have that tailwind going forward I think is absolutely key. So I'll talk about that. Second thing I'll talk about is uh, this idea of the, the zombie horde. And this is the, the zombie firms that year after year, they're not generating enough income to cover just their interest expense. And uh, as many of you will know, in Australia, um, these are at epidemic proportions, but what you may not know is globally, particularly in the US, um, this zombie horde is, uh, is really taking over. The good news is that provides extremely um, favourable environment for short enabled strategies like ourselves that can identify some of these companies that uh, are, are very much likely to be landmines in the long side of our portfolio or great short opportunities. And we have uh, over 100 red flags that we apply every single day to 10,000 companies to search for those companies um, that we can take short positions in. Okay, so let's get stuck into it. Uh, let's look at the long-term evidence. Uh, if you look at valuation versus growth, this isn't a, a back test as such. This is using MSCI value compared to MSCI growth. If you did nothing else but way back in, in 1974 invested all of your assets in MSCI value and shut your trading system down and then didn't look at anything again until um, 40, 45 years later, you would have just by doing that alone made a, it's just cut off here, 30% premium versus investing growth. So this is in line with all of the academic evidence. Value has a long-term tailwind vis-a-vis -vis growth. That said, the pandemic threw that on its head. We saw that growth, that growth style outperformed value by a staggering 70% over a few short years. To anticipate what is going to happen next, which is ultimately the only thing that matters, I think it's very, very important to understand what drove that differential. Why did growth companies go so well? Was it the interest rates? Was it re-rating? Was it earnings growth? Um, fortunately, there's a very, very simple return breakdown that we can run that shows how much of the returns of growth over that period came from dividends, how much came from earnings growth and came, how much came from uh, multiple expansion. And what you can see here in, the, in the, the pinky red is that all of the returns over this period to growth came from PE expansion, okay? Earnings growth was actually negative and dividends were anemic, okay? What's really um, important here is if we look at the long-term evidence going back, 44, um, going back to 96, you, you shouldn't expect any return from PE expansion. Sometimes PEs expand, sometimes they contract. Um, and that's exactly what has happened over um, the last year or so post-COVID. We've seen that reversion to the mean, that multiple contraction. And value has outperformed growth by, um, by over 20%. But there's still a ways to go. There's absolutely still a ways to go in this trade. The outperformance was some 70%. We've clawed back about 22%. Um, the single best way in all of our research to indicate which style is, is likely to dominate going forward is the dispersion in valuation metrics. Um, here you can see that during the tech bubble, there was this massive unprecedented dispersion in PE multiples. Um, when the tech bubble burst, and rationality returned to the market, value had its greatest single bull run since the Great Depression, from 2001 through 2006. Um, what we see here is quite fascinating. During the pandemic era, this valuation dispersion um, actually eclipsed what we saw in the crazy days of the tech bubble. It's retraced a degree, but it's still at a very high level. So that bodes very well for all of you who are invested or pivoting into that value style. 
How is this relevant to Plato? Well, this here um, shows the breakdown of the Plato investment process, and it's basically um, four facets. We've got a sentiment facet, red flags, quality, and down here, grey, valuation. So valuation comprises about 30% of Plato's approach will always be biased um, to a degree towards uh, valuation. It's not the dominant signal. It's very much an all-weather process with a, a variety of, uh, of return drivers. But nevertheless, we're going to benefit from that environment. One thing that I think is, is very important, uh, um, I, I would say most fund managers probably spend 99% of their time on stock selection. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Selecting the right stocks is absolutely critical. But if you don't pair that up with very robust risk management and portfolio construction, you can easily blow a hole in your portfolio at, at different stress points. This is a proprietary tool uh, that Plato has built over the years called PRISM. And it allows us to do stress tests on the portfolio to see how would we fare if there was a big macro shock or dislocation in any one of a range of factors. Uh, it's a little bit hard to read here, but you can see in these stress tests on the right-hand side, we can see that our portfolio isn't significantly exposed. They're very small numbers to a big shock in Treasury yields or a big shock in inflationary expectations. Um, and that's very much by design. Uh, we saw over the last few years that the very best minds and most resourced individuals at the ECB, the Fed and the RBA were all on team transitory. They all got it totally wrong. Okay. So for types of risks like that, that we don't see as our expertise and we see as very hard to forecast, we tend to, to mute those exposures and concentrate on individual stocks, winners and losers, which, which is really our forte. The second point I want to talk about is, is this idea of uh, these zombie firms. And there's been a lot of this on the press. The, the term zombie firms was coined in uh, the 90s. Uh, some of you probably know, dating back to Japan, where ultra low interest rates and permissive banking systems let companies that were very unproductive just limp along year after year after year. Um, history certainly repeated itself here, where you've seen incredibly lax interest rates, fuel speculation and asset valuations in crypto, NFTs and, and any range of, uh, of junky investments. So why is that of interest to us? Well, it's of interest in terms of the active versus passive debate. Um, because there are so many zombie firms, and you can see here on the left-hand side in the US, that about a fifth of companies are defined as zombie firms. That means that they haven't been able to cover their interest expense with their earnings over three consecutive years. So that's at a historic high, okay? Um, why is that fascinating and really important to us? Well, it's great for active management in general because you can avoid those firms, but it's particularly good for us because they are very fertile um, ground for identifying shorts, companies that are going to really underperform substantially. If we just flick forward to here, we did an analysis of how do zombie firms um, perform over the long term. So this is back since 1996. And what you can see is $1 invested in zombie firms over this 20-odd um, year period um, grew to exactly $1. So horrible investments over the long term. Non-zombie firms, $1 grows to $8. Okay, so that's already a very good starting point to identify great alpha ideas on the short side. Um, how do we specifically do that at Placer? Well, we have something that I think is quite unique. It's a fully systematised um, process of over 100 red flags. Okay? And this was born of, of, of hard experience. I was actually invested in a Spanish tech company way back in 2014. It had gone up 44 times. The Spanish Prime Minister was hailing this company as the best thing that had ever happened in Spain. And sure enough, uh, a couple of weeks after he made those comments, um, it's identified as a massive accounting fraud. Stock price goes to zero, and the CEO is indicted. So, that was a huge learning experience for us, but we said, OK, um, what were the red flags that we missed? In this case, there was something incredibly basic they were using an auditor that was totally not fit for purpose and uh, didn't actually audit anyone else in all of Europe. So we said, OK, 
let's extend those red flags to every failure um, or scandal over the years we can get our hands on. We poured through the forensic accounting literature. We'll also help put your kids to sleep. And um, what you, we built up this list over the years where related party transactions from Enron and recently Adani, where if there's executives sitting on audit committee meetings, Kogan is a, a recent example of that, Individually, these red flags are actually not that powerful. They might give you a 51, 52% edge, but when you put them all together, the sum is far, far greater, um, the, the whole is far, far greater than the sum of the parts, and you get the most potent way um, of identifying both landmines that you want to stay away from and great short ideas. Six or more seems to be the magic number. If a company has six or more red flags, they tend to generate 15%, minus 15% returns uh, per year, which is obviously a, a great short opportunities. Brainchip is a domestic example that some of you uh, uh, might be familiar with. I saw some people smiling when I brought the, brought the chart up. Um, they're a company that had a three, Australian company, $3 billion valuation, and they make less revenue than most cafes. So some great short opportunities out there. Um, if you look at the performance of our strategy so far, so we launched it in uh, 2001, performance has been, has been very strong. Um, so after fees, we've outperformed the MSCI world by almost 8%. Um, but I think what's equally as important is how we've done that. Um, we're very conservative investors by nature. We're not looking to hit the ball out of the park. We're much more looking at hitting singles every single day. And the, the tracking error or volatility relative to the benchmark that we're taking is pretty modest, three or four percent. Um, so our risk adjusted returns are very strong, just consistently generating alpha uh, month after month. Um, and that translates obviously to the information ratio, so risk adjusted returns, but also um, the upside and downside capture of 1.2 upside and 0 0.8 uh, on the downside. If you look at the, what's generated a lot of the performance so far, so this is our performance in dark green relative to our peers, given to, to our, the, the pinnacle retail team, the performance has been very strong, but it's been very consistent through time, and that's a, a big focus for us. There's no point generating great returns and then just giving it up a, a month later. So what are the, the, the key takeaways? Well, firstly, I think that the outlook for value is extremely good. Um, you don't want to put all your eggs in the value basket, but you definitely want to have your portfolios tilted towards that direction. Um, second takeaway is active management is more important than ever um, because there's so many um, junky companies, if I'm being fair dinkum, out there. And the great news about that is that if you have a short enabled strategy like ours, which is 150% long, 50% short at all times, so it's got 100% net exposure to the market. It's not an alternative, it's not a hedge fund as such. It, it belongs in the global equity bucket, it will rise and fall with that market. Then you can generate great alpha um, with, those, uh, with those red flags. Um, um, so uh, if, uh, if you like what we've spoken about uh, today, then please reach out to our, our Pinnacle sales team and I'd love to have a, a meeting with all of you. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Don't go anywhere. We're